It's the improbable grand final decider. Some of the most exciting players to ever grace the boards in Australia. For a non-contact sport, there is no quarter given on the court between these two sides. With Adelaide looking to unfurl one more championship banner and equal Perth record of four titles, and West Sydney looking to finish the season with that win and feeling for the very first time, this is going to be one hell of a ride. So nestle down on your home court bench, replenish your drinks bottle, and get ready to enjoy one of the great basketball games of all time. Hello everybody and welcome. It is NBL Rewind time. Hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved. And if you are joining us after watching what was a remarkable win, championship win, all those years ago by the Adelaide 36ers. Welcome. If you haven't watched it yet, get involved. Watch this. Listen to this first and get back involved. You know exactly what we're talking about. And one man who knows what we're talking about. We've got a legend to join us in a split second. Liam Santa Maria off the top. My deepest apologies, man, because, you know, if there's one that stings, it's going to be this one. Welcome to you. Thank you, mate. Yeah, no, you're enjoying every little bit of it. My one tiny little chance yeah. to get a ring on my finger, mm -hmm. apart, from, apart from this one, uh, mm -hmm. was that 02 year. And uh, Marzi and the 36 has <laughs> ran all over us in the semifinals and then went all the way. Look, as I've said, we only had about 38 games or seasons to talk about a Brett Maher. So I had to choose the one that was at least related to us. As we do welcome in the legend, Brett Maher. How are you doing, man? Yeah, really good. Thank you. Going good. You know what? I know you, you lay awake a lot. I'm probably not thinking about the euphoria of this particular year. Liam lays awake for a whole different reason because that Titans team was really good, but you got going when it mattered. Yeah, we did. Just, um, I mean, it was a real up and down year. Most people predicted us to finish kind of sixth or seventh that year at the start, but we just kind of got a real good chemistry with the group we had. And um, obviously, Willie Farley uh, and Matt Garrison as our imports, and we had good young guys. and. It was just that classic combination of um, role players and um, a few main players working really well together and getting it done. It's the, uh, it's the obvious question and might be a hard one to answer, but where does, where does this one sit for you amongst A, the championships you won and B, this particular game for you and the performance you put in? Um, I rate it right up there. It's probably my favourite championship in the sense that uh, we weren't expected to win it. and. Uh, just the way it all came together. It was a really good group of guys we had that year. And um, particularly that, that last game, game three, was just one of those ones where everything went right. So, um, like, to be up by that much at half time and have, like, some X factors really come into play, like Ruben Sapwell come in and score an 18 in the first half. And just those back-breaking bank three-pointers that he shoots and <laughs> stuff like that. It was awesome. And it was one of those dreams where you think when you go into a grand final, you want to get it over and done with quickly in, in that game. And we're, we're pretty much over the line by half time. Mate, you, you guys went 14 from 16 from three. <laughs> in the opening half. <laughs> Talk about some of them right there. But what, what, was the, what was the feeling in that locker room at half time as you were slapping each other on the backside? 14 <laughs> from 16 from long range. I oh, was just like, how do we keep this going? Like, everything was going right. And, um, I think uh, Willie had been semi, for his standard, semi quiet in the first half, and, and that was pr probably good for us because he was the one that kicked up in the second half when we needed it and uh, played some real good minutes there. But he always worry about being able to prolong it for the whole length of the game, and uh, we're able to do a pretty good job of starting off. They made a couple of fight backs at us, but we're able to do a pretty good job of holding that lead. In that situation, in such a huge game, and everyone's going nuts. Okay, so you can't miss from beyond the arc. You're on fire, Rupert. And, and f you've had those moments in your career. Rupert Sapwell's first half, as great as he was, probably from a shooting sense at least, was probably a little different for him. But when you're living in that moment in the biggest game of the year, right, like, do you just continue in your own mind to, to stay on track and you're focused? Or do you allow yourself to be like, this is remarkable. What, what's going on here? Is it in that surreal kind of way? It is. It's a bit euphoric, really. You you kind of get swept up in a little bit, but I think everyone in that circumstance is so focused at the time, and it's probably not until the last couple of minutes when you're up by a, a decent margin that you let yourself go and really enjoy it. And yeah, I remember coming off the court and you just really soak that moment up. It's it's what everyone plays for, and 
I think like Jacob Holmes and Oscar Foreman, it was their first year in the league. So they came in thinking, how easy is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be able to win these all the time. And then as they found out, they're pretty hard to come by. So, um, yeah, you really treasure them. Let's go back 12 months prior. Um, obviously, it was a special period of time for the 36ers and in your career with the, the back-to-back titles, but it was heartbreak 12 months earlier. In I was hoping you didn't bring this up. <laughs> I still have nightmares. Bloody David Larry. But, uh, yeah, that was, it was a killer. And that was one that hurt us all so bad. And, and probably the thing that broke up that group that we had from the 98, 99, et cetera, that was really dominant with Darnell, et cetera. So I think to be able to get somebody in the quality of like Willie and be able to build something back that quickly um, was pretty remarkable. So, so, so when, when that group is, you know, like um, Mark Davis, le- absolute legend of the league and the club, but Darnell Mee, Kevin Brooks, Paul Maley, before those new faces arrive, having lost all of them, did you think well, here we are entering a rebuilding phase. That's what this is going to be. Yeah, well, I thought that year, and everyone predicted it that year for us to be a rebuilding phase. Mm. So that's in the back of our mind was probably there. But I think when you're playing, you always think you're a good chance, especially at the start of the year. And we had a decent season. I think we finished third or something mm. yep. in the finals. And we were lucky that year in that we played teams in the finals that we matched up on reasonably well. There were a couple of teams that we didn't. Um, match up on, but the results just fell our way, and then to get the home court advantage kind of in the grand final was handy. Well, well you're going to go there already, Brett, and talk about results falling your way. To be well, honest. well, that's actually a very <laughs> point because you say you talk about finishing third. Uh, ask the Titans, obviously first, Perth second. We both lose, mm. and whoops, the, the way the system was set up at the time, we stayed alive because and and went on to club it. But you guys then had home court advantage the rest of the way, and um, that obviously, as you say, that proved so important. Yeah, especially back then, uh, our home court advantage in Adelaide yeah. was pretty big. We didn't mm-hmm. lose that often here, and uh, to be able to train every day where you're going to play was our huge advantage that we've had for the last kind of 25 years or so and which the team probably has lost now moving to the entertainment center which i think has been a good move anyway but um it was a big advantage for us especially during those championship years yeah just on that from the moment you started your career training wise and playing all the way to your retiring did you ever shoot at another hoop in adelaide or just continually <laughs> shoot at the same two at the powerhouse <laughs> pretty much pretty much those ratings that are kind to me <laughs> it worked beautifully, of course. We'll touch on the uh, uh, the honour a little bit later on in the show. Uh, just, just on that, I, know I always ask, in particular when we have guests who the season wasn't expected to be as great lead to a championship, when you actually knew that things were ticking along the right way. As you touched on, finished third on the ladder, so you had a, a pretty good regular season. At what point did you realise that it wasn't simply a, a rebuilding year and this team had something that was a little bit more special than, than maybe the outside sort of experts were giving you credit for? Probably about halfway through, uh, Matt Garrison came into the team later on in that season and added a real boost and injection of energy. Um, his ADHD really helped our, our group. <laughs> and he was actually a really good link between our young guys in the group and the more older senior guys. So uh, when we started stringing some wins together, uh, we were feeling pretty confident. And then I think it was the week or two leading into the playoffs, we got pumped by about 30, I think. I um, can't remember who, who did it, but it really shocked us back into reality. And then we kind of got back on and got into a bit of a roll again. It might have been West Sydney, mm. right? I it think. might have been, yeah. I just yeah. remember um, it was probably the only time in that year that Phil gave us a, a real good serving. <laughs> he didn't do it very often, but he did it that week and we kind of knew we had to jolt back in. Speaking of uh, when did you know, um, Tell us about the process of, of bringing in Willie Farley, your first impressions of him. Like, I remember watching him that season, playing against him a little bit in preseason, going, this guy's like MJ. Like, the, he had the, you know, you could see, like, like Kobe, you could see he had idolised and copied a lot of MJ's game. And he came over here and just tore this league up. Yeah, he was. He was good. Um, like, we, straight away, he had similar features and mannerisms and 
were calling him Baby Jordan pretty much from the start. We we met him in China. He came and met us up in China. We're playing the national team in China and uh, against Yao Ming and and the rest of their crew. And we were the first team to beat the national team um, as a club team over there. And got the crowd threw water bottles at us. <laughs> I didn't appreciate it, <laughs> but yeah, we beat them, we lost to them, and we drew with them, and they didn't want to play overtime. But straight away, we knew we were on to something good. He fit in. We had a real good chemistry, and um, yeah, he's he's one of the great all-time one-on-one players that I've played with. He had really nice step-back moves, and yeah, just was a baby little Jordan. How do you guys, you two specifically, go about establishing that chemistry, knowing when when it was his time, when it was your time, how to kind of get that mix right? I think we're both at stages in our career where you kind of understood that. Willie um, really fitted into Phil's style of offense as well. It was a real free-flowing, uh, move the ball and then create sort of offense, which really suited him. I think uh, when he went to West Sydney, uh, his numbers dropped a little bit. I think he might have got bogged down in the... Um, X's and O's and having to run pretty strict systems but with us it was just kind of go for it mm-hmm. run out run, get the lanes and score and that was his strength so I, I think our team did a pretty good job of recognising that someone was hot and got him the ball you, you had a number of coaches and just on Phil so obviously those championships which also coincides with maturity as a player and, and probably the, the peak when it comes to your athleticism or the peak of your powers around that time but was Phil, was, was Phil the best coach for you at that particular time in the way you were playing your basketball and involved? I think for most players that came to Adelaide, his style, everyone wanted to play in that sort of style. It was a very offensively dominated style, which mm. when you compare, and everyone compared, because probably Brian Gorgian always gets compared to all coaches as probably the best coach of all time in the NBL. Um, no, it was complete opposites to the way they played their career. Mm. Phil was a very defensively oriented player and uh, was amazing at that end and then turned into a real free-flowing offensive coach. And Gorgian was probably a real free-flowing offensive player and turned into a defensive juggernaut coach. So, um, yeah, I think both styles really worked and that's been shown. But I think a lot of players wanted to play that real free-flowing style and it was enjoyable. That's a good point, actually. When, when Phil Smith was announced, did you, in your own mind, think we're going to be a real defensive, sort of mimic his playing style type of unit? Because that, that is obviously what the mind goes to as soon as any former player is announced as coach. Is, is that what you expected going in? Um, not really. After the first couple of trainings, mm-hmm. uh, you could kind of see where it was going and it was, it was pretty relaxed and controlled. And uh, Phil bounced off really well with... Uh, SJ with Steve Brini, they had a great relationship and uh, yeah, it was pretty relaxed. I remember when we played um, Brian Gorgian's team in the grand final with Magic and we went in and they had just finished their shoot around in the grand final series in 98 and he was having them doing slides and pitter patters and all sorts of stuff and we rolled in and we were doing three man wheeze, we were kicking the ball to each other and it was overly relaxed, you could say, but uh, it just seemed to work. Someone told us this story recently, right, Liam? Did someone tell us this story? Yeah, about uh, just 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 taking it a bit easy and uh, watching. Was it watching the Titans or watching the, the Magic? Who, Kevin who? Brooks. Kevin, Kevin Brooks. Brooks. Kevin Brooks. Yeah, which I think we were, we were sitting yeah. the hot chips, saying they're not going to be able to run with us in Game <laughs> yeah. Three. I'm assuming that was the uh, almost the same shoot around. Yeah, yeah, well, that was it. And we were sitting there going, "These guys are going to be." done by the time game time comes around. <laughs> we were fresh as, but uh, clearly that style worked for uh, Brian over his career and has done very well with it. Brett, um, that, I think about your career at Adelaide and obviously a lot of it is about what you did, but man, you had some awesome teammates over the journey, both in terms of like talent and ability to play, but just in terms of uh, guys and, and, and being uh, within a team sport. You listen, you watch this game back, and in the post-game walk-off interview, Paul Rees is just talking about how much he loves playing team sport and the, the people coming together. What would be your podium of teammates over the journey? Oh, it's a good question. Yeah, um, you're right. I had some great ones. I was very lucky in my first year. I was 18 coming into the team and 
I had Butch Hayes as a mentor there to play under, and I think he's one of the best point guards uh, that's come out of the country. So I got to learn a lot from him early and then spoiled by having Phil Smythe come into the team and be able to learn off him the next couple of years. Uh, and then we had Rick Brunson, who went on to play 20 years in the NBA. Uh, and then Darnell's probably my favourite player of all time to have played with at the 36ers as far as um, a two-way player and what he did. He was one of those guys that everyone wants because he won your games at whatever needed to be done. Um, and then uh, Willie Farley, uh, we had a great relationship there. Um, and I'm talking just as the guards that I got to play with because mm-hmm. they're the ones, I guess, that I had uh, the most chemistry with. Um, but then with the bigs and that as well, some of those in, with KB who revolutionised the game, I think, having a six foot eight guy that could do what he did with the ball and have that funky shooting style. <laughs> um, but Mark Davis, um, a lot of those early guys that I played with, I grew up in Adelaide and idolised. So to get to play with Mark Davis and um, Mike Mackay and Scotty, now all of those guys I've watched win the 86 championship was a huge thrill. Um, but uh, some of the other players like Dusty Riker and um, uh, that the played really well without the ball. Mm-hmm. So as you come off on ball screens, they just kind of knew where to get to and deliver the ball to. So um, I was kind of spoiled to play with some guys that really understood the game as well. I, I, I want to ask you about, why, I think Leon Trimingham is the best dunker the NBL has ever seen, the best in-game dunker. Like, do you remember some of the stuff you used to do at practice or stuffing around after training was it insane what you could see behind closed doors because what he did within games at adelaide and and sydney early doors was remarkable it was crazy he uh, he was ridiculous but someone that's like six four mm. and, and one time i remember we had uh, brett wheeler and willie simmons so two kind of seven footers close to seven footers and they went back to back and measured their arm span and leon had them by an inch either way <laughs> So, he, I don't know, his wingspan must have been seven foot something. and But ridiculous hops. Mm-hmm. What he threw down in training, uh, I haven't seen before. It was so explosive and electric. It was it was fun to play with because he could, he could make any pass look good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you throw up an ad, a bad one and he finishes. Hey, let, let's just uh, – sorry, Liam. I just want to talk about the championship that first. Is that where you're going to go, Liam, or you want to touch on uh, – no, no, I was just going to touch on – uh, Phil again yep, before we move on because he talked about him as a coach and then you talked about him then when you were listing off your favorite teammates over the journey I'm fascinated by that relationship because it early on it was an interesting situation we where we had him on uh earlier in this series and we we're talking about that period of time under Dunlap where he was the point guard for the boomers and yet you were starting ahead of him uh for the 36ers and then you guys have that period of time as teammates and then that long stretch of really successful time as player and coach. How did that relationship form and where did, how did it kind of build over the journey? Yeah, uh, that's a good one because it was pretty awkward that year, especially um, Mike Dunlap. We, all of our young guys in that group went over and spent a month or six weeks with Mike. So he knew us pretty well. Uh, so when he came in, he related as a college coach related to all us young guys pretty well and pretty suffice to say butted heads a little bit with some of the older guys and uh, Phil was obviously one of those and it was I think Phil handled it really well as you said playing for the Australian team and starting and not starting with the sixes it's pretty difficult to take Uh, and I remember when we played Melbourne in the quarterfinal or semi-final he came on and was ludicrous. He hit a bunch of threes and he just stayed mentally strong all year and dealt with it. But that would have been tough for him. And for me, it was uh, a huge stepping stone in that early in my career to be able to start and get good minutes and go through to a grand final and play um, some really good minutes against D Mac and, and those guys there. So, um, yeah, I, I think we had a pretty good bond, that group, though. We held pretty tight together. And then when Phil came in, we, we just always had a good relationship. I always rode in his car on the road. We always talked shit in the cars and that. And 
um, yeah, we've always got along really well. The championship. You touched on, obviously, a grand final. We actually had Darren McDonald on a little bit earlier in the series as well, talking about that particular game and series and, and season. But you'd been there or thereabouts. Grand final early in your career, I think semis and that you know, a couple of years later. And then, of course, that championship in, in 1998. Talk to us about that, the feeling of, you know, seven or eight years into this, into this thing of finally being able to get that ring. Before you do, Brad, I like how we've, we've already, we've hit Damon Lowry, mm-hmm. we've hit D-Mac. And it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I hope you don't show D-Mac hitting that game winner over me as well, because I've seen that a hundred times. The D-Mac amount of times requested. I've seen that, those Damon Larry free throws and D-Mac hit the game winner, it, it's not fun. This is Brett <laughs> Maher podcast. This is, we don't need to show that. <laughs> Damon Lowry gave us a 90-second uh, explanation as to why it was a foul as well, because we did put it on him if you got away with one. He said, no, 100% not a foul. So let's focus on a championship. When you got to you win game one at home, you get to Melbourne. Yeah, a lot of people, I think, thought, hey, this will go three, but you smacked them. Talk us through it. Yeah, we did. Um, we hadn't beaten them all year. So for us to win that first game, um, was a, not a shock, but everyone was talking them up as the best team potentially of all time. I think they were 24 and two on the year. And so for us to win that one gave us so much confidence. And then just once again, everything went right in that second game over in Melbourne. And um, I think it was more defensively than offensively. That I think we held them to 29% and we just played... We didn't have many defensive rules, but we just played a smothering defense that game. It just kind of clicked at that end. I remember that was one of the games where Darnell, I think, changed the game. He got some real early key blocks mm. on guys. And just every time they were shooting, they were second-guessing because I wonder where he was, I think, as much as anything. And at the other end, KB was on fire and uh, doing some pretty remarkable stuff. And the rest of us kind of just did our little roles to keep it going. Well, what, what, what's the overwhelming emotion for yourself? Of course, there's jubilation for finally winning one. But when you are in any sport around the world, you're, you're part of the Australian team, of course, you're, you're about to head to Olympics, you're right there as one of the best players in the country. When you do win one, because that, that carries extra pressure. Was, was there a fair bit of relief thrown in there as well? Because that nagging question of hasn't won a ring is, is one that plagues a lot of athletes. Yeah, it is. And uh, it is. It's, it's as much relief as anything. You just want... And, 12 years since the 86 championship. Mm -hmm. So you're just going, are we ever going to win one? And the quality opposition, like that Magic Mm -hmm. team was very good and clearly deserved to be overwhelming favourites for that. But I guess when you look back now, post-career, like you look at the team that we had as well and the talent that we had on our roster um, was pretty special as well. One of the things we love on NBL Rewind are the rivalries. We were talking. To, we were talking to Gorge. Was it last week? Last week, yeah. Um, yeah, Magic Tigers. He was talking about Magic and his teams against you guys. Obviously, over the course of NBL history, really Adelaide and Perth uh, have that great rival- mm-hmm. rivalry. But for you, was it was it Gorgian? Was it the, the Magic and the Titans? These back to back championships uh, for you. Was that the primary rivalry for you over the course of your career? Well, especially during that period of time they were the measuring stick by far they were the dominant team in that so uh, I think for anyone to win a championship you had to go through gorgeous teams and um, yeah that built up a great rivalry and then to play in the next year as well in that grand final and um, win the first game and then we kind of came in a bit overconfident in the second game and and they just beat us down in that second mm. game in 99 and then we had to really regroup to win it in the third game. But, yeah, Brian's team's really uh, tough. And um, I guess I didn't know Brian real well until probably the build-up for the 04 Olympics. Um, when he got named Olympic coach, um, he wanted to catch up with me while we, when we played in Melbourne. And that actually knocked us out that year in the semis or quarterfinals. So we... Um, Suffice to say, I went potentially on a little bender that night <laughs> and didn't get, home like, didn't get home till like eight in the morning. And I was supposed to meet with Brian at nine. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I slept right through the alarm. He rang the room and I had a rookie teammate. He kind of 
left the phone for me to pick up and I was out, didn't pick it up. So I started myself awake about an hour late for this meeting, went down to meet Brian, smelling of like alcohol, etc. <laughs> and that was one of the first times I'd actually had a good conversation with him. Um, um, Phil and uh, Brian obviously had a great rivalry. So they were left talking to each other for an hour while they were waiting for me to come down. And then I came down and talked to him. And uh, yeah, I got, uh, it was a bit of a different way to meet the new coach. Wow. Worst possible coach to, to meet in that shape too. Yeah. You know, like with the, with the focus on nutrition and sleep and diet and the lifting. But he actually said, when I talked to him later about it, he actually said that it was kind of good in a way because he thought that I was a bit kind of goody two-shoes and robotic. And he said it kind of gave him this different version of me that I was actually a, a normal human being. Jeez, I tell you, if you hadn't known that previously, mate, you could have stayed in bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as it was, like, um, it was really, I was a last-minute selection because I had a, a disectomy done on my back in the lead up to that 04 Olympics mm -hmm. and um, was left to kind of the last death knoll to get selected. And it kind of, it came down to myself and Sam McKinnon who was coming back off a knee injury. And uh, I think I was just slightly more advanced in my rehab. I, I got over it and um, maybe fit into that team or group a little bit better and uh, really enjoyed playing that Olympics under, under Gorge. What what's what 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 is that like? What what is that race against time? Like there's races against time in athletes everywhere trying to get ready for a particular game, but an Olympic Games is a whole new beast. Like what was that like? Where you're like, if I'm right, I'm going to the Olympics. If I'm not, I'm going to have to watch this and wait another four years. What was it like? Well, the timing was such that if anything went wrong at all, I was done. So mm -hmm. I was just really lucky that I had a dream run in my recovery, and uh, yeah, and got to go through. I um, kind of said to myself that I wanted to dedicate this Olympics to my son that had passed in 03 and so I had a lot of motivation to kind of get there and get it done um, and in a sense I don't know if Brian knew that or not but he knew that I had a lot of motivation to get there and also play well considering in 96 and 2000 I got very very limited court time mm. Um, he knew that I had a lot of driving factors, A, to get there, but then also to kind of prove myself at that level. You, you take us back to that 2003 year, because obviously we talk about the championship you won in 02. You came out and were just killer mm. in 03, runner up in MVP voting to, to Chris Williams. Um, such a big year for you in so many ways. Like, can you take us through the, the emotions of, of that year? Two people that stand out for me, uh, obviously the 36ers and Phil were amazing during that period, but um, Brian Gorgian contacted me and said, I know you're staying in Sydney and um, knew my circumstances and said, look, if you want to come out and shoot, you want to come out and train with the team, come out and train. So I actually went out and trained with the Sydney Kings while they're doing their pre-season. <laughs> For, the, for that year and um, so how amazing is that for another coach mm. to let someone that's going to be playing on another team come out and train. Mm -hmm. Obviously I wasn't privy to their team meetings but uh, <laughs> but to do that was amazing and the other one that really shocked me was um, Shane Hill contacted me and said uh, look I don't know if you're good for accommodation when you when you come into town, but uh, I've got an apartment, I think it was a penthouse, that wasn't being used for a couple of weeks. You need accommodation, feel free to hit me up and, and stay in the accommodation. So for someone that I'd had a massive rivalry through, mm. uh, not only the NBL, but um, uh, the, uh, with the Australian team as well, then, um, yeah, it was huge. We, we've seen we actually we've seen some of that happening just this off season mm. up with this <laughs> pandemic situation. Players getting caught in different states. Sunday Detch is going to be in your part of the world playing for the 36ers down here, training with Melbourne United and Southeast Melbourne Phoenix, and just just teams helping players out in difficult situations. Yeah, and this year uh, I think getting Donald Sloan into the group is going to be um, a real big factor because they've got so many young kids at the moment uh, coming through. And I love the kind of young group they've got with uh, 
uh, Josh Giddy and Sonny Deck and uh, Alex Madronia. Um, some of those young guards are really exciting, I think, for the future. I just, just, you just mentioned the rivalries. Uh, when, when you play, how did you find it? So your rivalry, you know, Hammer obviously talking as we had Hammer on a couple of weeks ago. We know what he's like. I was Andrew Gaze, you know, if not the greatest of all time, I'd like to know who someone else would disagree with. You have these rivalries, you're playing big games against them, and then Rock you're up. all on the road trying to become one to, to win a medal, an Olympic medal or whatever it might be. How did you find it personally in that situation? Yeah, I think it's tough um, in a way to kind of acclimatise the different roles. Like all of us were starters, all of us are used to playing big minutes, and then to um, come, like for myself, to then have to come off the bench and then play limited minutes. It's a real adjusting period mm. at different stages throughout your career to have to try and do that. And it was something that I really, at times, struggled with, uh, to be kind of one of the main players in a team, to then be one of the kind of 11th or 12th guy in a team. It's, it's um, a bit, A, a hit to the ego, but it's also hard to adapt to that sometimes. But when you've all got a kind of a big goal and you see the bigger picture of mm. like we're playing for your country, which is the hugest honour you can have, and playing against the best players in the world, um, for me, I kind of grasped that in a sense that uh, I saw the bigger picture to an extent. Hey, do you have an Olympic memory that stands out? Like it might be on court, off court. Is there one that, you know, obviously anytime you represent your country at the Olympic Games, it's incredibly memorable. Is there one that stands out for you? I've probably got two favourite ones. Um, playing against the Dream Team um, is a big one because uh, they were my idols, especially the 96 team, which was the second Dream Team. Mm -hmm. uh, playing against um, guys like Shaq and Pippen and Barkley and Peyton was a dream come true. Um, so to do that was uh, big to play against them at the Olympics. But the, the probably biggest game that I remember was uh, when we beat um, uh, Tony Kukoc and uh, Croatia in that uh, game to get us through to the top four. Mm. And Tony Ronaldson hitting that three-pointer in the corner. I think probably close to the biggest shot in Australian basketball men's history. Yeah. Um, to see that, be on the bench, be able to celebrate with the team over that moment and that game was, uh, was special. And one too, wasn't it? Four point play and you know a rarity in that moment. It just it's a perfect storm that led to that second. I was and the whole build up. There was some key free throws and all that, but when he hit that, it was kind of the game sealer and it was a massive shot. And um, just I remember the whole group celebrating it. Uh, probably there's one other one as well for the Olympics, and that was when Drewy um, came into the change room and told our team that uh, he was going to be the flag bearer for 2000. I think that was such a special moment for not only Andrew, but the whole men's basketball team, the recognition there of everyone. And um, to see that was, was pretty cool as well. Funnily enough, I'm actually doing a project around Sydney 20 years on, and I interviewed Gazy yesterday. And he, he said that when he was told, it was going to be a secret, when he got told, he rang his wife within five seconds, couldn't get out what he was trying to say because he was crying. And then he relayed the story about being down at Wollongong. He reckons that he went to speak and he got about two words in. It was quite obvious what he meant, but he couldn't go on. And then the pylon <laughs> happened. He said it's one of his most memorable moments in his whole career. Yeah, definitely. And Hoagie was with him, I think, helped him through an <laughs> emotional part of the story. But he goes, look, I'm not supposed to tell anyone, but of course I'm going to tell you guys. And told our group and uh, I think nearly everyone in the room started breaking down in tears. It was pretty uh, emotional. We've, we've done a lot of talking about other guys, uh, your teammates and, um, you know, like Drewy and, and Bear there. Let's zero in before we finish on you and just how, how much of a big game player you were. We talked about this with Leonard Copeland, who, who also came up big. And you know, you're in select company, having won two Larry Sengstock medals. And I think one of the things that Adelaide 36ers fans love about you and remember about you is how big you came up in, in big games. What was your secret to success in that regard? Um, I, think, uh, I think I'm competitive and maybe overly competitive. My kids would say that, that I don't let them win anything. So it was just that want to win and do anything to win. And 
I, I think maybe my goal was always to kind of improve every season, but not only that, to improve whatever I did in that season, I wanted to try and lift my output in the finals. So I think um, nearly every year I was able to do that. And so I was pretty happy with um, being able to adjust to that high level intensity of a final series and game. And uh, I guess my first finals in 98, I played really well in the quarterfinals and semifinals and then didn't play as well in the grand final personally. Um, and really wanted to try and change that and, um, and come up a bit bigger in, in the grand final series. And luckily was able to play in a couple more after that and, and kind of change that a little bit. T -t Take us into your sort of preparation for, for a big game, a game three, a deciding grand final game. How, how did you prepare for a moment like that to make sure that the moment didn't get the better of you? Um, I think it was more just trying to stay relaxed. Um, like obviously, by then, you know your role. You know the guys you're going to be playing. But for a lot of people, they get overcome by that moment. And so for me, it was about not being really nervous and overcome, but just being kind of relaxed, keep under control. And um, it was more kind of focusing on that side of thing for me. It worked. <laughs> it, it, it worked in the, in the biggest moments and and the biggest games. Um, Brett Markle, did you remember when, I'm not sure who told you, I'm not sure how the announcement was made to you personally, but do you remember the, the moment when it was like, hey, we love what you've done, this court, you've owned it for 17, 18 years, we're going to name it after you, your sickness is going to be on the court. Do you remember the moment? Uh, I do. I remember Paul Bauer was the general manager of the 36ers and called me up to the office and we had, were having a chat and he, he kind of said, yeah, look, this is what we're looking at doing. We, we want to do this. The only one kind of in the world that we're aware of at that time was uh, Red Auerbach at the Celtics, mm -hmm. um, having his name on the court. And he said, we think it would be something really special to be able to honour what he's done for the club. And um, it was pretty touching and emotional to have that uh, done. And, uh, it's a huge, um, I guess, amount of respect shown to me for what I've done. And um, I certainly... Um, really appreciate that they were able to do that. I, I kind of felt that um, I didn't know if they were saying, look, this is the only way we can get rid of you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, they, um, it, was, it was very nice. And now for that to be transferred over to the entertainment center mm -hmm. and to be able to walk into a stadium and see that the courts um, kind of named after mm -hmm. it is a pretty special feeling. Obviously, uh, was maybe two years ago, the Hall of Fame process with the club as well. And um, recently t announced that, you, you know, you're going to be back working, doing some work mm. with the club in different ways. Tell us about your, your current relationship with the club, the 36ers. Yeah, I kind of stepped back to the last couple of years and not had a heap of involvement in the club. I've been kind of working with the management, just kind of, trying to help with the past players side of the club because not, I don't think it's done real well in basketball um, mm. as a whole, but uh, also with the 36ers, just trying to get the right recognition for past players. And so we tried to set up a committee and I was part of that in trying to acknowledge um, what uh, great efforts past players have done. So we've now installed the uh, Hall of Fame for the 36ers where we're going to be inducting more and more players over the next, uh, well, onwards from now. So that's real exciting for me to see all of the players that deserve it get inducted and recognised there. And then, yeah, just this current year, Scotty Ninnis, who's uh, my best mate, and myself are going to be running the uh, community program. So just going out to the schools with the team and uh, running some programs there and also some school holiday camps. So for me, it's... Uh, finding ways with my time schedule to be able to give back to basketball and this has kind of fit in well and, and hopefully will work really well. You mentioned Scott Ninnis there. You played under him for a year, right? Yeah, my last season. He, he, <laughs> How was that? <laughs> it, was, it was good. We had a, obviously being such good mates for a long period of time, um, it was interesting to see how that was going to pan out but I think we did a pretty good job of having a good working relationship there and 
at that stage of my career, I had to be managed as far as my calves and Achilles. And mm -hmm. it was a little bit difficult. And he always razzes me that I was able to give 11, 12 years to Phil and my best mate comes along to coach me and, he could, and I could only give him one year. But, <laughs> but uh, it was an enjoyable year getting to play under him and seeing him kind of get that opportunity to coach as a head coach as well. And um, yeah, it was good fun. The league uh, as it stands now, Brett, and when you, when you watch the games, who in the last couple of years on the NBL floor have you most enjoyed watching? Um, look, as you said, we've had a really good rivalry with Perth and um, I love playing against Ricky Gray. So I think he's, if not the best player to play in the NBL, he's right up there and certainly mentioned in that conversation. And um, the guy they got over there at the moment, Bryce Gotten, is just legit superstar. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, he's, he's awesome. And another one that really turned me, once again, from Perth, when I saw him um, with the Australian team and that, I wasn't sure on him, but he has swung me a full 180 because Nick Kay was ridiculous to watch how he's evolved his game. And um, I really enjoyed watching him as a big um, evolve and play. So those two have, have been in the last couple of years really fun. I enjoy um, watching Jerome Randall, just the way he has his ball control and being able to get shots off and, for young, small players um, to be able to watch players like that and how they can get their shot off and use the ball, uh, I think, is a good one. Um, and he's excited to watch. He's one of the guys that brings players in. Do, do, you, uh, see, fans in. do you see slight shades of yourself when you watch Bryce Cotton? You know, like both shorter, smaller guys, high-volume scorers, play off two feet, high elevation on your on getting up on your jump shots do you, do you have a tinge of that when you watch him um look i think he's uh, i don't want to be modest but i think he's a, a bit of a level above me um he's he's legit i think he should be in the nba the only thing that probably is stopping him is is his height that he's probably more suited to the two guard spot and a bit undersized in that spot for the nba but um but out here, he is he's awesome. I always ask this question, Brett, and it's even more prevalent for you because you played so long for the one club. But did, did someone else have a real crack at you to try and get you out of Adelaide at some point in your NBL career? Yeah, I had some offers. Generally, I re-signed before um, that kind of came up. But I had a few clubs interested. In and one that springs to mind, my very last contract, uh, New Zealand put an offer to me. At that stage, they were looking for a more senior Australian player. They're looking to change their culture and get their culture right. And so, uh, yeah, came to me and, and put a really good offer forward, not just from a financial point, but the way they looked at my family, what I needed. We had a young child and they were willing to put nannies in and schooling and everything. And just the way they approached the contract process was exceptional. And um, I think a lot of clubs could probably learn from, mm. especially how they were going about it back then. And I was so close to going, not many people know that I had a crisis meeting at my house with my agent because their offer was quite a bit better than Adelaide's offer. And I ended up having to go to Adelaide and say, look, if you don't kind of get in the ballpark, at least I've got to go. Mm. There was no, no question that the offer was a lot better. And they kind of, Got to the ballpark just. Uh, it was enough to keep me here anyway. <laughs> I, I didn't realise, Liam, that nannying was part of the salary cap back yeah. in like the 0506. <laughs> well, of, you know, you yeah. learn a new thing. <laughs> there was an extra salary cap was... out of the salary cap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, do you, I, I know this is a, it's a question now that can't be answered, but do you think the court would still be named after you had you have gone to New Zealand? Because I yeah, still think it would have been deserved. Well, it's unknown, isn't it? Yeah, but, it is. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know. If they I'm going to say yes. Uh, I will say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are you glad, looking back, that you didn't go, that you're a one club player? Uh, I think it, there would have been pluses and minuses for both. Um, but, yeah, I mean, now when you look back and say that I spent my whole time in Adelaide, it is good to be only kind of one of a handful of players and 
to have the name on the court is a good thing, unless someone comes along and stamps on your name, then <laughs> well. other than that, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Did, well, on that situation, what were your feelings on it? Like, yeah, you brought it up. Yeah, did, I, I was like, do I go with this? Did it piss you off for a long time or just in the moment? Or like, no, it didn't piss me off at all. It okay, at all. all. I, I was sitting up. I used to do um, the interviews with the players after the game. So I used to sit up in the restaurant overlooking the game. And as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, no, this is going to get out of hand now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it did, and uh, I kind of I knew where he was coming from, um, why he was upset with me, and I guess the story is is that when he was playing in Adelaide, um, I sat and spoke with him a lot, and there was a point where he wasn't receiving payments, and I said to him, "Look, you're not receiving payments. It doesn't normally happen to you, but the only way you can get your payments is if you kind of say to him, you're not going to play." And so I I said that, and then. He, he did do that and he sat out of some trainings and, and some games and then the club um, was saying some pretty average stuff and, and wanted me to say something on behalf of um, the playing group. And so I just come out and said that I was a bit disappointed that he hadn't told us as a playing group what he was actually doing, whether he was going to come to trainings or mm. miss games. We were left in the dark as well. And... That's, and I think he kind of embroiled my comments in with the other stuff that the club was yeah. saying. And so I could see where he was coming from, why he wasn't happy with me. But, um, yeah, it was a little unfortunate for sure. Did you speak to him? Had you spoken to him? Or have you spoken to him since that incident? Um, not really. I, I played a couple of years later. We had in Adelaide that uh, High Stakes Hoops tournament. Mm -hmm. And I end up putting together a team and we end up playing against his team and he wanted to match up on me. And, um, our team won. Uh, <laughs> That's <all that> matters. <laughs> but uh, we didn't really chat. I, I was just like, look, I understand where you're coming from, yeah. but yeah. it's a little unnecessary. And, and mm. to Melbourne's credit, like, they had some classy people on that lineup, um, guys like Worthington, McKinnon, Anstey, that mm. kind of rang me straight after and said, look, we had nothing to do with this. Um, we're disgusted in the way he acted and it was pretty classy the way they contacted me and explained it. Uh, it's fascinating to hear you talk about that, that situation because it's a great example of how there's always so much more to a situation mm. be, be below the surface in terms of the relationships and things that have happened previously than what the general public experiences just watching it play out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I had a great relationship while he was here. I had a really good relationship with him. And I think he, as a, um, as a player that couldn't really shoot the ball beyond 15 feet, is one of the most dominant players that's ever come to the country and could get stats like no one I've ever mm. seen. Um, it was crazy. And I think he's still the only guy in the history of the NBA. Remember he played with a cast on his arm in a game for Melbourne when he broke his rear? Like, had to be legal, but he's the only man I think in the history of the NBL to play with a cast from his from his wrist to his elbow in the NBL. Let I him remember, play. I remember um, Phil Smith played with a cast. Did uh, he? Against the Adelaide 36ers before I played. Yeah. And um, yeah, he, he played with a cast on his arm, and I remember I think it was on his uh, I can't remember which hand, but uh, I remember thinking whoever was guarding him let him dribble up the court with his good hand. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you can't even play Wednesday night domestic with a pocket in your shorts, but you can play in the NBL with a cast on. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> hey, Brett, before we finish up, the Sixers this year, Donald Sloan, of course, announced today. Oh, hey, this is what happens, Brett. He gets excited. He kicks it out every time he gets excited, talking about signings and news, and he kicks out his microphone. Liam, we got you? Okay, come on, man. I need a new mic. I couldn't need a new mic. <laughs> How do you think they're going to go? Is, is this the playoff team? Well, when you get so many new players into a team, it's a bit unknown and everyone's optimistic um, at the start of the season. I think because they've got such a young team, they'll be a little bit up and down, but they've certainly got some talent there. Once again, it's going to be how that talent comes together. There's going to be a lot of pressure, no doubt, on Donald Sloan because... Um, I think he'll start the season as maybe a single import mm. and whether they get a second import is going to be unknown. And 
you look at our list compared, and you, you're always going to compare yourself to teams like Perth, etc. Um, and they've lost a couple of players, and I'm, I'm thinking hopefully, finally, they're going to miss a playoff so that they can stop rubbing it in everyone's faces that they've been in a playoff for 30 plus years in a row. Um, but then they've got Cotton, they've just got their new signing over there. Um, uh, who was that that they've signed up? Mooney. Uh, John Mooney. Um, so I think they're going to work really well together and um, they'll be tough again. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they get that mix. But I, I think um, having Connor there and, uh, and Jamie Perlman coming in as well, I think they've got some good leadership at the top. And we'll see how that comes together. Hashtag NBL Rewind and get involved. Any last questions, Liam? No, man. I think we've, we've pulled it all Coming apart. Up. Just uh, thanks for coming on, Brad. Great to kind of get walk, stroll through memory lane with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed watching your show and um, seeing some of the, the guys and their stories. It's always really good to hear it. Did you, did you sit at home going, when are they going to call me? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> you should have been, and I'm glad we have, and it's been fun. Uh, hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved. Uh, if you haven't watched the game yet, NBL TV, Twitch, Facebook, Insta, wherever you get your NBL content, check it all out, NBL Rewind. We'll be back this time next week. NBL Overtime on Tuesday. We'll see you then.